Hey there, guys. It's uh, David Barnett from davidcbarnett.com, the YouTube channel, iTunes podcast, and SoundCloud podcast, and and blog site that talks about buying, selling, managing, and financing small and medium-sized businesses. Today, I've got a list of questions, all from John, who's a student in New York City, and he wants to know more about vendor financing in, uh, in doing a deal to buy or sell a business. And uh, so I figured I would answer this in a recording and share it with all of you guys, um, because there's some some great questions in here that and and John has a couple of assumptions in here that I need to address, which I think that um, the answers are going to be really valuable for everybody who's able to tune in. So here are the questions. Number one, in general, who is in control of negotiations when it comes to seller financing? Does the buyer use it as leverage to offer a higher purchase price? And does the seller typically dictate the terms? Well, the answer to this one is that is that it's always subject to negotiation. And in general, sellers, unless they're they're informed sellers who have been listening to this channel, for example, um, if they're normal sellers, the, the kind I see the most often, they don't want to do vendor financing at all. They want their money. They want cash, right? And they see vendor financing as a risky thing. And, uh, and they don't want to do it if they don't have to. So what typically happens is the vendor will say, no, I don't want to do it. The buyer will try to work out a deal and then the buyer will go and try to get financing from a bank and will be turned down and then may come back and say, look, you know, we're going to have to do it this way if you want to sell this business. Then they'll negotiate back and forth on both the price, but also on the terms. And I've seen, for example, sellers that have you know, unrealistic expectations of their price and buyers will say, look, that doesn't work. There's no way to cash flow unless you're willing to the, agree to this kind of term. So we're going to put the loan over a really long period of time with a really low interest rate. And that's the only way it will cash flow. And so basically it, it's the normal give and take back and forth of negotiations. And uh, the sellers uh, will try to dictate the terms, but of course, you know, the buyer has to agree to it. Um, number two, you've mentioned some unique clauses when purchasing a business with a partner. I'm curious if you have any go-to covenants or clauses you include when writing each of your two seller financing contracts. Well, this, um, you know, I, I didn't understand this question the first few times I read it. And then I realized that what John is thinking is that if you have two owners of a business and they sell the business, that the buyer would actually be writing two different vendor financing notes. And that's not the case, generally. Um, we do sometimes do deals where there's more than one vendor financing note, but it's not usually because there's two different sellers. We often use the term partner when we really mean shareholders, okay? But if you actually did have a legal partnership between two individual people um, and someone was buying their business and there was vendor financing involved, usually that note would be made out such that the, the lender was both of those people. The two partners would be one party on the note. So they're partners in the business, and when they sell, they become partners in the note. So they both have the same status. If you wrote two different notes, what could happen is one note could be current, the other one could be delinquent. And then um, you'd have the problem of each partner having a different, you know, uh, motivation or, or different, you know, want different outcomes from what could happen as far as foreclosure and collection and everything. So when we do split the note uh, to create more than one vendor financing note, it's usually because of another reason. And again, both of the notes in a split note situation are both made out such that the seller, whether it's an entity, person, partners, etc., you know, the seller is the creditor on those notes. Question number three, was there bank financing ahead of you in the capital structure on any deals that you did? If so, did you need to sign an intercreditor agreement of any kind? What was your communi communication with the bank like? Um, no, in any of the deals that I've ever done, the there was no communication required with the bank because normally the bank, when they are involved in a deal, so let's say you've got a buyer putting cash down and then you have a bank lending against certain tangible assets and then you have vendor financing for the balance of the deal. The bank is going to examine the agreement. They're going to see that there's vendor financing and all they're going to do is when they advance money to the uh, attorney or the lawyer or the solicitor, whoever's doing up the, the 
contracts and paperwork and the closing, they're simply going to put in there that they require a first position lien against whatever assets are going to be their collateral. And so in order for the lawyer to use those funds and release them to the seller, he has to follow the letter of direction coming from the bank, which means that he's going to give them, you know, first position liens on whatever assets are outlined in that letter. And sometimes the letter from the bank is in conflict with the deal, in which case the uh, lawyer advises the buyer and the buyer has to go talk to the banker. But the seller is usually not asked to sign anything from the bank, you know, to subordinate their position or anything like that because the bank's lien is put there first. So it's usually not required. Um, did you require your buyer to submit a credit check, financial statements, a personal guarantee, fingerprints, or a criminal background check? Well, in all the deals that I've worked on, I've only actually once had a vendor want uh, a credit check from a buyer and other financial information. Usually the buyer is a little bit hesitant to reveal too much about their financial position because sometimes the buyer's asking the vendor to do a vendor financing because they can't get the money from the bank. If a personal net worth statement, for example, were to reveal that the buyer actually had enough cash sitting in a bank account to do the purchase, that could upset the deal because then the seller would say, look, I'm not going to do vendor financing. I want you to use your own money. So um, buyers would probably resist. Um, buyers would probably agree to a credit check if they were asked. You see, the unique position that sellers have in doing a vendor financing is that they're not actually writing a check for cash and then hoping all that money comes back. They're lending money that <clears throat> they don't actually have to put out of pocket. Um, they're just owed the balance on the transaction. And the other unique position that the sellers have is that they know how to run the business. So if they ever have to foreclose, they're not foreclosing with an eye to liquidating to getting money. They're foreclosing with an eye to getting control of the business back again so they can run it and make it become profitable and sell it again. So, so their aims are a little bit different than what we, we might normally consider from the point of view of a bank because a, a bank is going to actually write a check. They've got funds that go out and then they have to be worried about collecting all that money. It's a little bit of a different point of view. Um, I've never had anyone, including a bank, ever asked to do a criminal background check on a buyer, um, which when you ask the question, um, is kind of curious to me. So I guess even if you've committed a crime, um, as long as your credit's good, you can probably still get a bank loan. Um, question number five, what percentage of the transaction value can I expect for legal fees associated with seller financing? Um, it would be so negligible, it would be hard to break out because typically what will happen is the lawyer will you know, do a whole bunch of things for the transaction and the vendor financing note is literally you know, often a one-page contract and the terms are worked out between the buyer and the seller in their agreement, in their, their offer to purchase or what have you. And so the lawyer just uses that to create the note, and uh, it's usually just part of the package. And normally, for example, in an asset sale, um, the lawyers are going to come up with several contracts. The vendor note is just going to be one of them. So it's often part of a big package price. Um was your seller's note interest only with a balloon payment? What is the most common structure? So interest only with a balloon payment, for those that don't know, what that would be is a, a note or a debt that says you have to make certain payments every month or just pay the interest every month. And then after five years, the entire sum is due. And that is common in some industries. And in, uh, for example, in Canada, in the mortgage market, that's how mortgages are written. So most Canadians will get a five-year term on their mortgage. It doesn't mean they pay for the house in five years. The amortization of the debt could be 25 years, but they get a five-year term. And at the end of that term, the entire sum is due. But if they've never been delinquent and the note is always current, the lender simply rewrites a new contract at the current rate. So, um, you know, I've had several houses where the mortgage term has come due and you just get a letter from the bank in the mail saying, you know, this is the day your mortgage is due and we will be rewriting the contract at this interest rate. And that would be the opportunity you would take if you wanted to shop around for other financing. Here's the problem 
from uh, the point of view of a seller in doing a note with a balloon payment. If you did a note like this, if a seller sold a business with a, a note that required a balloon payment after five years, what you're basically doing is gambling that the economy, the business, and the industry are all going to be doing well in five years' time and that the buyer has properly managed the business and will qualify for the credit to pay out the note. And what if that doesn't work out? So you could have a buyer who's doing a good job running the business, but the economy isn't doing so well and sales have gone down, profitability has gone down. He can't qualify for credit, but he's performed on the note and he should be able to make payments to cover, to pay off the debt, but he can't get the loan, right? What are you going to do? Foreclose on him? So what I always, always, always say to everybody who's doing a vendor financing note is you must have a way, a mechanism in every note for the note to become fully amortized without any intervention or any need to qualify for credit from somebody else. So in some of the deals that I've done, for example, I've had notes which have said this is an interest only note for 60 months, at the end of which it becomes a note at a certain percentage interest rate, which is to be fully amortized over X number of months. So the note itself has a mechanism in it that says after the five years are done, it now converts into an amortizing note and the principal and interest payment every month will allow the debt to be fully paid off in so many months. And that way the buyer never has to go and qualify for credit from someone else, um, which which is a gamble because we, we don't know what's going to happen years down the road. Um, and the most common structure for vendor financing notes is some kind of amortizing payment. And normally what happens is vendor financing notes can be anywhere from two to seven to 10 years. And they usually amortize over that period of time. And I mentioned earlier about split notes when I've done them, it's because we've had to we've had to try and meet certain bank rules. So let's say you have someone buying a business and the bank requires a certain minimum debt to equity ratio on the buyer's opening balance sheet. And let's say that they don't have enough equity. Some banks will agree that if the part if the vendor financing note, let's say, is for five years and it's interest only, they'll agree to count that as equity because there's no cash flow drain on that obligation. So it acts more like equity than it does debt. And so when I've done split notes, I've sometimes had a large vendor financing. I'm thinking of one case where the vendor financing was $270,000 and we split it so that 130,000 was interest was uh, no interest, no payments for five years. And that allowed that hundred grand to be equity in the eyes of the bank, which meant that they, their debt to equity ratio they were looking for was met, which meant that the bank could make their loan. The other part of that $270,000, the other 140 grand was a normally amortizing note. And so there are two different notes, both of them written by the seller, both of them with a different aim and goal in mind, each with a different purpose. Um, were there any problems post-close with your buyer? Missed payments, late payments, wrong amount, bounce checks, etc. How did you remedy them? Um, in, uh, in notes that I've done, I've had lots of late payments. That's why I always put in a late payment fee because it means that you get to collect a little bit of extra money. Um, and normally, you know, it's up to the seller, the, the person who holds a note to enforce the note. So if the payment is missed, then they got to get on the phone, they got to chase down that buyer and they got to enforce their rights as a creditor to try and get that money. If they do nothing, what eventually starts to happen is their rights as a creditor will begin to erode because they create a pattern of basically telegraphing that it's okay for people not to pay them. And if there is some kind of problem in the business, then you know, you're, you're going to want to get ahead of it if you can. Um, it can happen just like it can happen to any lender. And what traditionally I see and in the deals that I've worked on, the buyer and the seller, they do a transition period where the seller teaches the buyer how to run the business. And that usually creates a relationship between the two of them. And 
because the seller needs the buyer to be successful in order to collect the payments, then the seller has an interest in being helpful to the buyer. And the buyers have usually put down money of their own in the form of the down payment. And they, of course, want to be successful because they don't want to lose what they've put in. And so a relationship is created that usually survives the transition period. These people often talk to each other, sometimes frequently after the deal is done. And some of the sellers end up sort of in like in a coaching or mentoring role. And what happens is that if the buyer is having problems, one of the people that they often will contact is the seller and say, you know, have you had this problem before? What have you done in this situation? And so for a completely out of the blue occasion to occur where a payment is missed or a a check bounces, um, it would usually come back to some kind of error. And usually the buyer would be able to, to make that payment right away. Or the seller will probably have a knowledge that something may be coming down the pipe that could be a problem. And one of the great things about having that personal relationship is often there can be an agreement made between the two of them to do things like, you know, have the note turn into an interest only note for a certain amount of months if there's some kind of cash flow issue in the business, or maybe some payments get deferred, or maybe some, you know, payments are delayed or something like that. By having two people who know each other work on these things, we can often work out a solution that is going to create the largest likelihood of success for the buyer to get back on track. And if that's not the case, if if it's completely obvious that things are going down the drain and the buyer's toast, well, then the the seller, they want to get back in and get control of the business if they're still able to run it so that they can salvage the value in the business. And in that case, the buyer actually has an interest in helping the seller repossess the business in as, ex, as expedient a fashion as, as possible because if there are bank loans, if there are bank loans outstanding, what will happen is the, the seller will foreclose on the buyer and the seller will then go to the banks and say, look, I, I know that you guys want to be paid. I'm taking over the business again. Would you let me take over the, the loan here at the bank? And the banker, he wants to get his money. So they're going to say, wow, if there's a problem and we may not get paid, then yeah, we'll, we'll let you take over this payment. And that saves the bank and it can save the buyer from all the repercussions that might come from having a delinquent bank account. And again, the relationship is the key. The two people understanding, you know, what is going on in the business after the transaction. And then your last question is, did your seller and, and, to further highlight the relationship part, a good qualified business broker from the very beginning of a deal, or if you're trying to do a deal on your own and there's no business broker, the relationship is the key thing to create. And more often than not, when there are problems with these deals with respect to collecting on these notes, what happens is it's it's like perhaps a realtor put the deal together and realtors are trained to keep buyers and sellers apart. They don't want a relationship because they're all afraid that if the buyer and seller create a relationship, they're going to use that relationship to try to screw the realtor out of his commission in some way. And so it's when that foundational relationship is not created that things all of a sudden happen. All of a sudden, you know, I didn't get paid and I didn't know what was going on and I wasn't talking with the buyer and I had no idea what was going on in the business. It's because they haven't been set up to create that friendship and to create that that relationship which will carry people through good and bad times. If the relationship had been there, the buyer would have reached out long before trouble was at its end to try and get help from the seller and get advice from the seller about what to do to, to straighten things out because the seller is the one who knows the business better than anyone else. And so the last question here, did your seller, seller financing agreements require profit and loss inventory or other data, and did it include a non-compete? A few of the seller financing notes that I helped put together did include some kind of obligation on the buyer's part to submit information to the seller to help them keep an eye on the business. Um, Many of them did not. Um, It really, it came down to the level of awareness and concern that the seller had and how much they wanted to keep an eye on the business. 
Um, on April 28th, I'm actually speaking in Las Vegas at the Paper Source Seminar and um, at the Tuscany Hotels and Suites. And one of the things I'm going to be talking about is how note brokers and note investors can talk with business brokers about how to help create notes that are more marketable uh, for the secondary debt market. And um, these are some of the things that would help make a note uh, more saleable because an investor would be able to see that they'll they'll have current information coming at them about the status of the business. And no notes, uh, debt notes, vendor financing notes do not typically include non-compete clauses. Um, usually non-competes are completely separate agreements on in their own right. And usually there's a non-compete, but also a non-solicit. And a non-solicit agreement is when um, a buyer or sorry a seller agrees not to go and hire people away from the buyer so if they decide to go and get into a new business and they they think that they want to hire some of their old employees a non-solicit agreement is one that prevents them from doing that so great questions john and um you know uh happy to answer them for you and for anyone else who's out there who has questions about buying selling financing or uh, managing small and medium-sized enterprises, please send in your questions. You can always find me at davidcbarnett.com. And if you are in a position where you want to sell your business, you want to learn more about it, make sure you go over to howtosellmyownbusiness.com where you can take my online exit planning course. You can download a free ebook that I have there, 12 Things to Consider, 12, 12 Things to Do Before You Consider Selling Your Business. And if you want to buy a business one day, uh, the most economical way to learn from me is to invest uh, the time and money in my nine-hour Business Buyer Advantage course, which you can find over at businessbuyeradvantage.com. And with that, we'll say see you later. And if you happen to be in Las Vegas on April 28th, it'd be great to see you at the Tuscany Hotel. And you can learn more about that at papersourceseminars.com. Thanks. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.